Morning, guys. Uh, so this is our last section here in the energy option. Uh, yesterday's lesson here, we introduced uh, silicon as a semiconductor. Uh, semiconductors here have a band gap that's intermediary between metals. Uh, the band gap is so tiny that it's really easy to promote electrons into conduction band to make it conductive. Uh, and uh, non-metals, which typically are insulators, that band gap here is a little bit too large. Uh, for silicon here, which is sort of a moderate ionization energy, uh, it's uh, possible for it to gain enough electron, uh, enough energy. Uh, we talked about uh, heating it up as well. By heating it up, generally more electrons can get up from that valence band up into the conduction band. The more charges I have in that conduction band, the more conductive uh, my semiconductor is going to be. Uh, silicon can also be doped with small amounts of other chemicals. I can dope it with group 15 elements here because group 15 here has five valence electrons as compared to silicon which only has four. That net excess of electrons makes it an n-type semiconductor. I can also dope it with a group 13 element. Group 13 here has only three out of the four valence electrons. So I have a net lack of electrons. We can think about them as actually positive holes. Electrons then fill in those holes, and we can actually think about it's actually positive holes that are migrating back and forth. So in that case there, we have uh, improved the number of charge carriers by doping in with group 15, group 13. And then what we started seeing is by putting the P and N type semiconductors in close vicinity, uh, we have a natural flow of charges at the very beginning, but over time, because of the charge buildup, we end up creating what's called the depletion layer. Basically, once the charges are set up on the boundary, no extra charges want to migrate through that boundary anymore. What we then did is we hooked up an external circuit, and we said, all right, so if I use solar energy, I promote even more uh, N electrons, I free some more electrons on the N side, I can actually create another wiring to actually allow the electrons flowing through my external circuit to actually make it to the other side because I have electrons flowing in one direction. In that case there, that would be my direct current. Today what we're going to look at here is that sort of design, a solar panel here, and we're actually going to be talking about specifically one um, uh, circuit component called a dye-sensitized solar cell, and we're going to sort of com compare and contrast it with uh, basically what, how plants photosynthesize, and we're going to see how we look at what plants do, and we actually engineer these cells here to do something very similar. So uh, on the slide here we have a solar panel. A solar panel is actually just a huge array of these PN junctions. So not just one, um, so it's just sort of cascading just one after the other. And we also hook up our wiring so that um, the electrons can flow through the external circuit around the depletion layer. Uh, the charges can go where they want to go, but I can harness that electrical energy as the electrons flow in one direction. So solar panels here are simply a massive array of these photovoltaics. Uh, let's uh, look in a little more detail here how these sort of PN junctions are uh, actually hooked up. Specifically, one type of solar panel here uses a dye-sensitized solar cell. So we're going to shorthand that here, DSSC. So we're going to be using a colored dye. The colored dye is going to mimic uh, the uh, chlorophyll molecule here. This is the part that has that conjugation structure. It's able to actually absorb the solar energy. Um, um, in this case here, because I have the PN junction here, the solar energy will be used to create a net excess of electrons in what would otherwise be the n-type side, the more negative side here. Uh, because of that natural p-n junction here, the charges, once they flow naturally and created that charge buildup, they don't want to go through the boundary anymore. I can then hook up an external circuit and allow the electrons to go around the outside. We're going to be uh, spraying this dye here on top of uh, TiO2 nanoparticles. We like the nanoparticles later on, we'll see, because it has really high surface area here. That's going to serve as our anode. Uh, in this uh, voltaic cell here, remember the anode is going to be the net negative side. So even though this is not quite an n-type semiconductor, we're not actually doping it in this sense. But we are going to be freeing electrons here. We're going to have a net buildup of electrons, and the electrons will naturally flow from anode through the external circuit over to the cathode. The cathode, I have another chemical. Usually it's going to be like this iodide triiodide mix here. These guys then pick up the electrons to then complete the circuit. This would be the net positive side, which can then absorb and soak up some of these extra electrons here. So we're going to do these um, in steps here. Uh, the dye molecules, so instead of actually using chlorophyll here, which has a large uh, conjugation structure here, uh, the dye molecules here, I would imagine, would also have conjugation. We need that alternating double single double to actually absorb visible energy. It absorbs light and it promotes electrons up into those higher energy levels. So in this case here, we can imagine starting off with just dye, D, it can absorb the light energy and it can end up forming this D star. D star here is an excited dye molecule. Uh, 
because this one here is excited, it can actually lose electrons. It can actually uh, ionize, it can form the D+, plus. I can lose a net excess of electrons. These free electrons here can't get through the PN junction. Uh, they can actually go through the external circuit. Um, this dye here, like I mentioned, is sprayed onto the TiO2, so they're showing you one extra step here. The electrons are first passed to the TiO2 before they actually make it through the rest of the circuit here. We also sort of surround it with a glass uh, coating here. We want it to be sort of anti-reflective enough so that the light doesn't bounce off of it. We want maximum light to actually strike our dye color TiO2 molecules. And again, we like the nanoparticles because it has uh, a lot of uh, surface area. So the electrons that uh, were released from these excited dye molecules here are first passed directly to the TiO2, and the TiO2 is hooked up so that it can actually uh, travel to the other side here. So looking more so at this design here, the electrons that get passed to the TiO2, um, they can travel through this external circuit in a one-way path here. They can get around the PN junction uh, and then end up getting picked up on the other side. Once the electrons are in the conduction band of TiO2, so these are the nanoparticles, this is the increased surface area, they can then flow through the external circuit to power our devices. Uh, if I com compare that with the analogy of photosynthesis here, uh, in photosynthesis we call it an electron transfer train, how the electron is actually passed one to the other for that redox reaction to actually occur. Uh, in this case here, we're sort of mimicking it here, we can actually absorb the light energy in the same way chlorophyll does as the electron actually passes through the external circuit. That's sort of like the electron transport train that you learn about in biology. Uh, the DSSC, they mimic photosynthesis. So once these electrons, they've traveled through the external circuit, I've already been able to taper off some of that electrical energy. I need to make sure something is willing to gain those electrons. They have to be reduced. So in this case here, uh, it doesn't have to be triiodide, but this is a very common chemical that they use. Triiodide can then pick up those electrons. They reform iodide to complete the circuit there. So in that case there, we're going to end up with a bunch of I- minus as the, sort of the reduced species here. Remember earlier on, we saw the dye. It became di star when it absorbed light energy. Uh, upon ionization, it became D+. Plus. And what's happened here, just to fully complete the circuit here, is those D+, plus can actually reduce the... Um, the, triad, the I minus can actually reduce the D plus back into the low energy dye, and this is now ready to absorb uh, fresh light energy again. So basically, we look at uh, a biological system of how plants do photosynthesis. We mimic it based off conjugation. We mimic the electron transfer chain. We rely on this PNN junction to not allow any charges to flow between naturally this way, but we provide an external circuit that electrons can travel actually around. They're going to make the emphasis here that TiO2 is typically as in the nanoparticles. So again, that increased surface area just allows the light to actually strike more places. It could be just direct sunlight or it can be concentrated interior light here. Uh, again, you can picture here, it's the dye molecules that actually uh, serve as the chlorophyll that are actually absorbing, absorbing the light radiation. And that dye is sprayed onto the TiO2. So the, TI, uh, the dye, which ends up losing electrons, first get past the TiO2. It's in the TiO2 that the electrons get promoted to the conduction band, and they can end up traveling to the opposite side here. So this side here is the anode side. This side here is the cathode side. In this case here, we can maximize efficiency. Uh, we're going to just compare. How does a DSSC compare to just a generic photovoltaic? Uh, very common design, but they always like asking this question. So we'll end off with this slide here. Because of that really huge surface area, that TiO2, those nanoparticles here have a lot of uh, room that the sunlight can actually strike, that can actually promote electrons, can actually excite those dye molecules there. It makes the SSC in general very efficient. In general, when we actually design these ones here, the materials that we need is typically much cheaper than engineering these vast arrays of photovoltaics, kind of cascading them one after the other. Uh, the efficiency of a photovoltaic actually decreases as the temperature increases. So although we do need the sun's uh, light here, sometimes in hot areas where they get a lot of sunlight, uh, that increased vibration, just like in the metal case here, it's going to cause it harder for the charges to actually travel through. But DSSCs here, empirically, we find that they're not as effective. So that's another advantage. DSSCs here can also work uh, better with uh, concentrated uh, sunlight. So they can actually work better in low light conditions as well. So. Uh, this is another just compare and contrast. Uh, we know they're based off the same basic design, uh, but this is some advantage of a DSSC over photovoltaic. So let's flip over uh, over to our textbook slides and let's have a look at what happens.
Okay, so this is the textbook section here for, uh, for those DSSCs. Uh, I'm just going to rehash uh, one of the diagrams that we saw from yesterday here. We start off here with the n-type semiconductor. Remember, n-type semiconductors here are doped with group 15 elements, uh, whereas a p-type semiconductor here is doped with group 13 elements. You don't need a ton of them. Um, the n-type semiconductor has a negative, so it's an electron. That's the charge carrier on the n-type. Uh, the hole here, which is the net loss of electrons, because I only have three out of the four valence electrons, we can assume that they're actually positively charged holes. You're going to put the n-type and the p-type semiconductor together. At first, what's going to happen here is, like we mentioned, the electrons are definitely going to want to go in the rightward direction here. They want to travel to the side here, which has the net positive attraction. The positives here at first also want to go to the other side because as electrons flow to the uh, right, it's sort of like the positive holes are traveling to the left. This only carries around for a little while here. We create a junction. We call that the one there a depletion layer. And basically, we've set up an electric field which has one side overall negative and one side overall positive. Once that electric field is set up, uh, if I have even more electrons here, usually what we're going to do is we're going to uh, shine some sunlight on it here. We're going to free some of these extra electrons into that connection band. Those electrons will have less and less desire to actually travel to the opposite side here. Better yet, we actually provide an external circuit here. The electrons can still get around where they want to be. They want to fill up some of these positive holes, but they're not going to be combining directly through here. They're actually traveling through the external circuit. It's through this external circuit that we can uh, taper off the electrical energy there. Um, so in that case there, uh, we're able to transition the solar energy that we saw uh, up into electrical energy. Uh, for today's lesson here, we just uh, mimic that uh, using a DSSC. So DSSC stands for a dye sensitized. It's a dye sprayed on top of TiO2. It's a solar cell, a PN junction here that's uh, using this design here. Uh, so let's actually start off on the anode side. So the anode uh, for voltaic cell, again, is the negative side. The anode is a, a porous titanium dioxide layer, so TiO2 layer. We talk about the nanoparticles here because it has high surface area. That's going to be advantageous for efficiency. The TiO2 itself is actually sprayed with this dye, right? So it's actually colored over with this dye molecule. As we mentioned here, the dye molecule here is going to uh, uh, mimic what chlorophyll does. So I would expect here's a sample of a dye molecule. doesn't always have to be this guy. But in this case here, you notice that it's forming these sort of almost like benzene rings here. And we know the benzene ring here, this delocalization, is indicative of a sort of double, single, double, single, double uh, sort of pattern. So definitely the dye itself, the spray that you put on top of the TiO2, has that conjugation that we need to absorb energy. In that case there, uh, the carbons themselves are sp2 hybridized, meaning we have p electrons on each of these rings here. Because those p electrons are in the same orientation, the electrons very easily move around this conjugated structure here. Uh, they form an extensive pi system. And remember, basically what happens is we have electrons in the pi. If I shine solar energy on it, we want to convert it from the pi electron, we want to excite them into those pi star energy state here. So in that case there, it's able to absorb uh, the solar energy here. The longer the conjugation, the higher the wavelength, the less energy it needs for that excitation. So it's actually able to absorb sunlight, uh, just like the chlorophyll uh, molecule does. Um, so let's actually start in terms of our reactions. Let's actually start with step number one. So the dye that's actually coating this TaO2, the dye actually absorbs sunlight. So dye plus sunlight, or some concentrated uh, light source, puts the dye into a dye star state. The dye star here is going to be your excited state, or an excited electron. What's going to happen here is this dye uh, excited molecule here is going to then ionize. It's going to end up forming a charged form of that dye, dye plus, and it's going to release that electron there. That electron here does need to be moved to the TiO2. Remember, that's all happening at the coating. That's all happening uh, where the spray is, where the colored molecules themselves are. Those electrons have to be passed over to the actual TiO2 to promote the electrons for TiO2 from that valence band, from that lower band there, up into the conduction band. Remember, for a semiconductor, in this case here we're using TiO2, it does have a band gap, but that band gap here is not as big as uh, like an insulator would have. So once those electrons are actually excited, we're going to have a net buildup of electrons here. Um, 
basically the electrons don't want to recombine because the electrons are continuously being lost. We're getting more and more negative charge here by hooking up an external circuit, just like we did in the photovoltaic. We're actually allowing electrons to actually flow in one direction. Again, we taper off our electric energy here. For the charges to actually flow though, we need to complete the circuit. So on the other side, we need to engineer something that can get reduced that can then pick up these electrons here. In this case here, we typically use uh, just some uh, um, thing, some oxidizing agent that can get reduced here. Uh, we're going to use triiodide. So in this case here, I'll triiodide here can pick up two electrons and reform three I minus. They can regain those electrons. The triiodide, upon grabbing these electrons, they end up forming the I minus again. Uh, that all happens inside the electrolyte. That all happens in this layer in this side of the DSFC. And remember the one extra step here is unfortunately the dye ended up being positive upon losing those electrons nicely because this I is a negative charge here the dye itself can actually get go back into the neutral form and can actually uh, gain that electron back from the X minus ready to do it again so again let's uh, go over one more time the dye that's sprayed on top of the TiO2 first gets excited it absorbs the sunlight it becomes dye star the dye star here ends up ionizing and ends up losing that electron uh, that electron is past the TiO2, gets promoted up into the conduction band. We allow it to travel through the external circuit. On the other side, the electrons are first picked up by your uh, oxidizing agent, by the chemical getting reduced uh, on the cathode side. Uh, it reduces the I minus, and then the I minus there ends up reducing the uh, dye plus back into the uh, regular dye uh, normal. That's how we mimic photosynthesis here. There's many places in science where uh, we see what naturally occurs here and we say, oh, that's neat, or let's see if we can sort of copy that design. In this case here, this is sort of our copy of photosynthesis in plant cells here. They really like asking this question for the section here. Compare a DSSC against just a standard photovoltaic, a standard solar cell that doesn't use this uh, dye-sensitized uh, design here. Um, the dyes themselves have this conjugation, so they're very, very efficient. And because they're sprayed onto uh, nanoscale nanoparticles of TiO2, that large surface area allows it to have really high chance of absorbing colors. We can actually play around with many different dyes. Just like chlorophyll, I can change the R group and I can change the relative lambda max, uh, what color is actually being absorbed. I can actually create multiple different dyes to cover more of the visible spectrum. So when the sunlight gives me a whole bunch of different wavelengths here, I'm able to transition more of that solar energy. Eventually, it gets converted to electrical energy anyways, but uh, being able to cover more of the visible spectrum here will make it more efficient. In this case here, in terms of the manufacturing perspective here, it's fairly simple, relatively speaking, to manufacture. You can manufacture it with low-cost materials. It decreases the design that you need for huge uh, uh, rooftop solar conductors that typically are very heavy. Uh, they're not really reliable as well. DSSCs are a lot more convenient to work with. Uh, in this case here, even on a cloudy day here, we can probably concentrate enough light here so DSSCs are known to be able to run in low light condi uh, conditions. Part of it's, again, due to uh, I'm playing around with different dyes here that can cover more of the spectrum. Let's write that down here. Uh, I can use multiple dyes to cover uh, more of the visible spectrum. I suppose this could even go into the uh, UV region as well. All we're doing is we're converting what the sun is giving us into the electrical energy. Uh, but if we really talk about the analog with photosynthesis, we uh, specifically are worried more so at the visible side. Remember we said uh, in an earlier lesson here, it's the conjugation, right? conjugation, this alternating, alternate uh, double and single bonds, that's the feature that actually allows it to absorb radiation. And in fact, what we saw was the more extensive or the more longer uh, the double, single, double pattern showed up, uh, the less energy for excitation and therefore we can actually absorb uh, a, a higher wavelength. Remember there's an inverse relationship between uh, energy and uh, wavelength. Uh, what are some disadvantages though? Right? Again, there's no uh, one size fits all and it always is a pro, there's no disadvantages. The disadvantages here is uh, sometimes the UV radiation uh, from the so uh, solar radiation, it actually degrades the dye. The dye becomes more like a, a chemical structure that's more sensitive to the environmental conditions. We wanted the dye having the conjugated structure so it can absorb radiation, but it turns out when the sun uh, shines the UV radiation, it actually starts degrading the dye itself. 
uh, we have a problem if the DSSC is put under two extremes in temperature. If we're really low temperatures here, sometimes the electrolytes, we typically do the triiodide I uh, I minus mix here as a liquid. So if I'm overly cold in some places here, it can actually freeze the electrolyte. Uh, that can stop the power production. If I have hot temperatures, typically for semiconductor, hot temperatures should increase the conductivity. However, in this case here, the hot temperatures will make the liquid actually expand. It will cause some sealing problems. And in this case here, they've already come up with a nice fix here. You're not stuck with using triiodide and I- as a mix. You can actually uh, replace it. They've done it with the cesium tin compound here, and this is known to be a much longer lasting, a little bit more stable, and a little bit more efficient. So uh, that's uh, some of the disadvantages or the extremes based on the electrolytes. We don't want it to freeze over. We don't want it to expand. Uh, and the dye molecules, if you compare it to just plain old silicon, this has to do with that lambda max here. Uh, remember, lambda max, if I plot an absorbance versus wavelength spectrum here, for every chemical, there's always going to be, uh, um, if it, let's say it absorbs in the visible region here, there's always going to be a wavelength. We call that lambda max. Lambda max is the wavelength which it actually absorbed the highest. Uh, so the maximum absorbance, it can soak up the most uh, light. Sometimes the chemicals actually have multiple peaks, right? And that can actually, it's an intensive quantity, it can actually be used to identify the substance. What they're saying here, just dollar for dollar, if you just contrast them, without actually playing around with multiple dyes and trying to cover more of the spectrum here, the dye typically has uh, less uh, absorption in the red region here. And in the red region here, there's going to be fewer photons that can absorb in that 700 nanometer site here. And therefore, if it doesn't really cover that part of the spectrum, we can say otherwise that sunlight is lost. Uh, that does finish us off for the energy option here. Make sure you are practicing through some questions here. Uh, and uh, on tomorrow's lesson, we'll just uh, do a quick summary over um, the uh, whole uh, chapter as a whole. Thanks, guys. Take care.